Uh, but today, I want to get into this topic. And anytime I talk about worship in any form, I always get that, well, you are a worship guy. Of course, you're going to talk about that. Well, duh. <laughs> but it's more than that. It's, it needs to become a lifestyle for us. And, and so as we get into this topic today, you know, we've been talking about God's word being the only truth that we need. We've been talking about God saying, trust me that he's Jehovah El Roy, right? That he's the God who sees us. We've talked about God being the God of the impossible. We've talked about God saying, hey, no matter what you see in the circumstances in life, you can depend on me. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how God needs us to love people like, like he loves us. And then last week, probably my favorite one so far is just keep running. Right, just, just keep pressing on no matter what's going on in your life. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Just keep pressing on. And today we're going to talk about waiting. Who likes to wait? You know, the average person spends 52 days of their life just waiting in line. Probably about half of that at the DMV, right? No, that's only California, I know. Uh, about 52 days waiting in line. At one point in Russia, when McDonald's opened, 30,000 people stood in line for over eight hours to get their first Big Mac. Yeah, I wouldn't do that, right? Here's my favorite one, though, and not because of the, the, the topic, but it's just amazing to me. A Beatles concert here in the United States. Everybody heard of the Beatles? All right, just check in. A, a Beatles concert had a one-mile line. Now, just to put that in perspective, that is from here to 111. A one-mile line just to buy tickets at the box office 90 hours before the box office even opened. What if people sit in line like that for church? Depends what we're hungry for, right? But here's my favorite story in my studies this week. In 2012, there was a man who called customer service for uh, Qantas Airways or Qantas Airlines. It's the, you know, the main Australian uh, airline. And he was put on hold and he was told, quote, please hold for the next available representative. Someone will be with you shortly. His name was Andrew Kahn, and he said he was calling the airline uh, just to confirm that his flight details were right and he knew the hours and all that. I guess he wasn't checking all that on his phone at that point. So he calls the airline at 7.22 p.m. on a Wednesday evening, thinking that you know, the wait would be shorter because it's nighttime. And he says, when it got to over three hours, that was the point I decided, okay, let's see how far this thing goes. So he starts at 7.22 p.m. on a Wednesday evening, and finally at 11.01 a.m. Thursday morning, 15 hours, 40 minutes, and one second later, his line was disconnected. He said during his wait, he surfed the internet, he slept, he caught up on some reading, and he never obviously did speak to anyone on that call. Now, he says he called them back and got someone right away that he was caught in some kind of glitch, but, you know, who knows? Sometimes waiting on God can feel just like that. Right? How many of you, don't answer this out loud, just think about it, but how many of you have been waiting on God for a while now? Wondering when God's going to show up, when God's going to do what you've asked him or what he's promised to do. And sometimes it's just not the right timing. Because God knows something that we don't, right? But because of that, we end up doing what? Waiting. Now, waiting isn't fun. Waiting is often difficult. Especially if we're in need or, as I've learned in my life, that I'm usually not in need. I'm more in want, than I am in need. But it's no fun when we're waiting. In fact, those of you that are parents, every kid who is of age has asked you that famous question from the back seat of the car, are you, we, because they're sick of what? Waiting, right? No one likes to wait. Because if we were in control, we'd do things differently, wouldn't we? Right? If the world was left up to us, everything would be perfect. Because we would solve all the world's problems, just do it like I tell you, and then there's not going to be any, any kind of problem. But waiting is part of life. And I believe that waiting can be when we spiritually grow the most. I don't believe we grow so much spiritually in the good times. I believe, not that we can't, we do, but I believe we grow the most when we're waiting on God to come through, when we're waiting on something to happen. David was anointed king. 
but he had to wait 22 years to actually become king over all of Israel. Right, Joseph had to work as a slave, and then he got demoted to prison and had to wait. Job, we've talked about him before. Job had to wait through unimaginable suffering. And even if you think about the disciples, boy, after Jesus is gone, they had to wait in the upper room until God said that it was time for the promise of the Father. But there's a key in each one of those stories as we jump into this today. See, David had to wait because God knew he wasn't ready yet. Remember, he was anointed as a kid. And then there was this period of maturity that had to happen. And even when he did become king, he didn't become king of all Israel. That didn't happen for another, I think it was seven years, some Bible scholar can correct me, after he became king of, of the other tribes. Because God knew he wasn't ready yet. It, it was about David maturing and David growing up. Right now, Joseph had to wait because God knew that it wasn't time yet. And it was about others, right? The famine wasn't in full swing yet. It wasn't yet the, the right apex of conditions. And so God had Joseph waiting because it just wasn't the right time for the benefit of those that were around him. When you think about Job, why did Job have to wait? We read it really fast, but it, it went on for a while there. Well, Job had to wait because his life became a demonstration of God's glory, which we've been talking about today, and faithfulness. Because when you think about suffering, who's the one person in the Bible you think about? Job. He became the quintessential example of, of God coming through after in terrible loss. Now, the disciples in the upper room, they had to wait. The Bible tells us very clearly why they had to wait. They had to wait until there was unity in the house. Right? It says, and when... They were all in one accord, in one place. Then the Spirit fell. By the way, that's happening here. The church is beginning to come together in unity at Trinity. It's one of the reasons I hated going to two services for this, but I knew we had to for a period of time, because there, there was something happening in the unity of the church as we all came together. And I believe it's continuing to happen because God's not limited by those things. But I'm just saying, get ready, because God's going to do something, because the, the, we're, we're coming together. So here's what I'm learning, though. It's not just enough to wait, right? How many of you wait, but you wait angrily, <laughs> right? You pull up to whatever your favorite fast food place is, and there's like 27 cars there. And you're just like, oh, how many of you got out of line because you didn't want to wait, right? Because it was too long, especially depending on where the place is. It's not enough just to wait. It's while we, what we do while we're waiting that matters, I'm going to say that again. It's not just enough to wait. It's what we do while we're waiting that matters. And I hear God today saying, what did I say? He said, I'm telling you to learn to worship me while you're waiting. Now, what does worship look like? We're going to get into that here for a minute. You know what David and Joseph and Job had in common when you read their stories in Scripture? They were worshipers. About every single one of those men, it was said that they got up early and they worshiped the Lord. Another interesting commonality really between them is they, they never blamed God for their circumstances. They trusted him. They honored him. They worshiped him no matter the situation. Now, those are great examples, but for me personally, the one that stands out in Scripture is this guy named Abraham. Anybody ever heard of him? We're going to read several or a long passage today about Abraham. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. To me, he's the most amazing example on this topic of, of waiting because he had already waited a hundred years, right, for his promise to show up. So he waits a hundred years, and then Isaac finally arrives, and then now several years later, right, Isaac is growing to, to maturity, He's being asked, Abraham is, to do the impossible. And let's just take a few minutes and let's read from Genesis 22. Sometimes I read just a few verses, but I think we need the whole context here. So bear with me for a minute. Genesis 22, starting at verse 1. And this first verse alone may cause some of you some theological struggle. God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac. Now, why did he have to clarify? Because Abraham actually had another son, but he wasn't the son of the promise. And at that moment, I could hear Abraham almost negotiating with God. You mean Ishmael, right? 
And God's like, nope. And you knew that, Abraham, before you even asked. But he says to him, yes, <laughs> Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. I, I have tried. I can't even fathom what emotions ran through Abraham's mind at that moment. Because all we see is what happens the next morning. I doubt Abraham slept that night. I, I doubt that he immediately made peace with this. I imagine that his faith went through all kinds of mental gymnastics during those next several hours. But in the end, he knew he was left with one choice obedience so the next morning Abraham got up early he saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about my mind wanders do you think he told Sarah I'm thinking no On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will, what's the word? Worship there. See, he knew he was going to go sacrifice his son, and yet he called it worship. And then we will come right back. Now, whether that was a faith statement whether that was him just not letting on to his servants and to his son yet, we don't know. We can try to read into it any way we want, but we, we don't know. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac. Of this entire story, probably this verse gets me the most, that Abraham would willingly tie his son up and that his son would willingly allow himself to be tied. There's a lot that had to happen right here. And he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice, or as we saw in the earlier verse, as an act of worship. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am, which is the same thing he said at the start of this journey. God, here I am. Verse 12, don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. And if you study that out, what it really means is now you know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place, what we would say today, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. And here's the catch. Because you have obeyed me, See, sometimes obedience is a form of worship. Because you've obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name, that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? All because you have obeyed me. See, worship sometimes, church, is a choice. It's a choice to obey God no matter what he's asking. And this story, like I said, I just, I, I absolutely marvel at it. I, I can't fathom it. I can't even really put myself in that place. And to be incredibly honest, I doubt I would have done it. I love my son. And this kind of obedience, this kind of worship, I mean, the price is simply 
astronomical. It, it's, it's unimaginable. Now, clearly, we understand when we study Scripture, we, we know that this was a picture of what was to come with God sacrificing his son Jesus. But I guarantee you in this moment, Abraham was not waxing theological. Right? In this moment, he wasn't busting out the strongest concordance, trying to figure this thing out. At this point, he was incredibly struggling with what to do and yet made a choice to worship God through his obedience. He chose to worship while he was waiting for God to provide something else. And we're going to see in Hebrews in a minute what was going through Abraham's mind. But Abraham shows us that worship can manifest itself in, in many ways. And to be clear, when we say worship, we're not just talking about whether you clap your hands in worship or raise your hands in worship. That's an expression of worship, but it's just it's a minuscule part of it. In fact, I would dare say that if you're worshiping in here like this but not worshiping God when you go out there with your life, God's not really pleased with your worship in here. Right, because worship is a lifestyle. Worship, worship is how we live our lives. It's not just the expression on a Sunday morning corporately. Worship is living my life in such a way that everything I say and do brings honor and glory to God. See, this means worship isn't really about music or anything like that. Worship is about obedience. It's saying and doing what the Word of God and what the Holy Spirit speaks to us. In Hebrews chapter 6, it's talking about this situation that we just read about. And it's the, the I mean, Hebrews is just such a great uh, book many times about faith. And in verse 13, it says, For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. And God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. And then it says that Abraham waited patiently. Right, this is talking about that 100-year gap. And he received what God had promised. Now, this is one of the rare times that I think the older translations do a better job than the newer ones. Because in the King James, it says this. It says, in blessing, I will bless you. Actually, it probably says thee, now that I'm thinking about it. But in blessing, I will bless you. And I think the original translators got this right. Because when you really look at it, what it's telling you is, is that the blessing of God is released as we worship. In blessing, as you bless me, God says, then I will bless you. As you choose to position your life in a place of worship, that no matter what comes, you're going to obey, and you're going to wait when God says wait. As we bless God with our obedience, as we bless God with our worship, however that manifests itself, God says, when you do that, you've now released the windows of heaven that I can bless you. Now, sometimes in Scripture, we have promises that are just ours by virtue of our position as, as children of God. Other times, there's places like this where God's saying, it depends on you first. And if you choose to bless me, if you choose to worship me with your life, then I have blessings waiting for you. So the question becomes, how do you wait peacefully? Right? How do you wait willingly, obediently? How, how do you worship while you're waiting. And I just want to share four things that I've seen come true in my life. And maybe some of you can find your, your life application, your life situation in this. And this is the first one. Sometimes worship is sowing in tears so that later we can reap in joy. That's worship. You don't think Abraham shed a few tears on the way to Mount Moriah, wiping them away so Isaac couldn't see him? Of course, it, it had to have happened. Because he was about to offer his son. In Psalm 126, verse 5 says, Those who, you can help me with this, those who sow in tears show what? Reap in joy. If you don't know that verse, you need to highlight that one. Those that suffer are going to have a blessing. Those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And this is where Abraham found himself being asked to sacrifice the son of his promise. Now we read later in Hebrews that Abraham had the faith that even if he killed his son, that he believed that God could raise him back to life. I call that desperation faith. Because at that point, you're out of Hail Marys. Right? I mean, you're out of other options. If you follow through with what God says in that situation, the only option you got left, because if you believe that, that Isaac was the son of the promise, then God's going to do something miraculous to raise that back to life. And most of us, myself included, would spend our time praying away the sacrifice, praying away the opportunity to worship, 
instead of allowing God to manifest his glory in the suffering. So Abraham finds himself here. And we find ourselves in, in, in the same place. We're in pain, right, where we're struggling. What's God doing? And I'm just here to tell you today that the word says that God sees your pain. God sees your tears. God sees your hurt. He sees your sorrow. He sees the struggle. He sees what you're going through. And he's not some ambivalent guy hanging out there just, well, I can't really do anything about it. That's, we believe in a God who's involved in our lives. Amen? And here's what Psalm 56 verse 8 says. And obviously, the writer of this psalm was going through some struggle. And he said, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. And you have recorded each one in your book. Don't ever believe that God doesn't know what you're going through. Don't ever believe that he doesn't know the cost of what he's asking you to do. But also believe that those who sow in tears are going to one day reap in joy. And that is worship. Worship is trusting God even when it's the darkest of nights and you don't understand what's happening. You choose to believe and follow God and to be obedient to his word. That is worship. And I personally would argue that might be the sweetest worship of all. Second thing God's teaching me about how to worship while I'm waiting is that sometimes worship is waiting in silence while God works. Some of us are social media folks, and we like the whole world knowing that we're suffering. And God in his great eloquence sometimes says to me, Jason, shut up. Stop talking. Just be silent. And just wait and watch and see what I do. Psalm 62, verse 5 through 6 says, Let all that I am, right, everything about me, my mind, my voice, my tongue, my heart, let all that I am wait quietly before God. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I will not be shaken. We used to sing this old hymn called Rock of Ages. Anybody sing that one? Clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Anchor yourself to the rock. He's the only thing that's going to get you through. It's not your bank account or, you know, your status or, I mean, any of that stuff. None of that is rock solid. You can lose it in a moment. What you'll never lose is your ability to be anchored to the rock no matter what's going on in your life. And can I tell you that sometimes the best faith is the faith that doesn't have to say anything at all because you're waiting quietly knowing that somehow, some way, God's going to do what he promised and God's going to come through. It's kind of like that verse about fasting when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and he tells them, he says, you know, stop looking like you're fasting when you're fasting. Right? He says, comb your hair, wash your face, and just go about your day like normal. He says, otherwise you've already got the blessing you're going to get. That, that little bit that people are like, oh, he's a faster. He says, no, no, just go through your day like everything's okay. And I'm not saying we don't bear each other's burdens and we don't pray together. That's not what I'm saying here today. I'm saying that sometimes you need to just grow up a little bit and trust God that he is who he says he is. Wash your face, comb your hair. By the way, had somebody asked me, Pastor, what's up with the facial hair? Um, this is vacation laziness at this point. I haven't decided if I'm keeping it yet, so you're feel free to vote. You can let me know what you think. All right. <laughs> right, sometimes you just got to just get yourself together with the help of the Holy Spirit and go about your day and wait silently for the Holy Spirit to show up in his timing to do what he's going to do. Because complaining about it is not going to do anything. I guarantee you that's not worshiping. Sometimes worship, sometimes faith is saying nothing at all. So spend your energy in worship, not in worrying. Third thing God's teaching me is that sometimes worship is choosing to remember, and I maybe even say always, worship is choosing to remember God's faithfulness. God is so faithful. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, The Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him 
and obey his commands. You ever read this line about a thousand generations in the Bible before? Well, if you do the math, and I'm not trying to tell you where to fall on the new earth, young earth, old earth, and all of that, how old mankind is, but if you believe the Bible, right, and you count mankind's lineage back, you get somewhere between like 4,000 and 4,200, 4,300 years, somewhere in there that mankind has been on the earth, all right? Now, depending on what generation you use, now at this point in Scripture, if I remember correctly, uh, a, a, a lifetime was 120 years, right? So they estimate that at that point, a generation was about every 30 to 40 years. Let's use 30. Let's, let's go to the, today, right? Let's say that every 20 to 25 years, we have a new generation, right? So if you take the low number, take 20. Someone please take 20 times 1,000 and tell me what you get. It's not a trick question. <laughs> it's 20,000. If you believe the Bible, we're not even 25% of the way there yet. What this scripture is saying is, really, he keeps his covenant forever. Forever. More than you can possibly imagine at this point. Forever. And lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey. There's that word again. Obey his commands. And that's why in Jeremiah 31, 21, choosing to remember God's faithfulness, it says, set up road signs, put up guideposts, mark well the path by which you came. Now, I am not typically a journal, you know, entry kind of person. I, I don't keep a daily journal. Uh, my wife does a lot of that. I, I, I track it differently in my own life. But there are moments in my life that I will write down and, and, and record from my own history of things that God did. Because sometimes you have to look backward to have enough faith to go forward. Right? Sometimes you have to look backward to have enough faith to go forward. And we have to choose to remember that God has been faithful in the past. Now, for some of us, we struggle with that because we equate faithfulness with God doing what we want. And that's not faithfulness. In fact, that's, I would argue that that's not being a God at all. God knows what's best, and I'm very thankful that sometimes he didn't answer my prayers. Right? Because things might have ended up completely differently. But we worship when we choose to remember that God has been faithful. And then the last one. Sometimes... Worship is choosing to declare the victory in advance. Sometimes it's silently waiting because your heart needs to get right and everything's got to get right in here. Sometimes it, it, it's weeping and sowing in, in, in tears because there's, there's got to be a, a breaking and, a, and a, a thing that has to happen on the inside before God can move you forward. Right? Sometimes it's simply rehearsing all the goodness of God and what he's done, but sometimes your faith has got to kick in and you've got to start declaring by faith that what God has promised is going to happen even though you haven't seen it yet. And for some of us, that can be difficult if we've done that and then God didn't come through. Or God didn't do what we wanted him to. But worship is sometimes choosing to declare the victory in advance. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says this, we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had. Remember, we've been reading Psalms these last couple of points. We have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. Right? Sometimes when you hear God and you get the green light that it's time to start talking about it, you got to begin to proclaim in faith, you all did this about a year and a half ago. Do you know what you said? You said, I'll remind you, you said, the best is, right? Because you began to speak in faith, something that God had deposited in your spirit, and the time had come to speak. Right? Sometimes there's silence. Sometimes there's weeping. Sometimes there's just remembering. And other times it's time to get vocal and declare the goodness and the faithfulness of God in your life. And the Holy Spirit will guide you when those times are. And I've found in my life that, and I want to say this carefully, that my choices can make or break my season of waiting. Right? I, I didn't say that my choices necessarily change God's plan. 
I'm saying it affects how I live while I'm waiting for God to come through in my life. And declaring the goodness and the faithfulness of God is saying the same thing that the Word says about your situation. But to do that, you got to do what? You got to know what the Word says, right? You got to get into it and make sure that you understand it. You have to align your life with the Word. And if we're going to, you know, if we're going to walk by faith and, and not by what? Not by sight, which 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us about, then you have to begin to declare the promises of God in your life. You've got to begin to speak them over your life. You know, sometimes um, I have back issues, right? And I'll go see a chiropractor. And uh, I had a chiropractor tell me one time, and of course they do their adjustments and their little magic, and um, chiropractor once said to me, he said, the problem really isn't your back, I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> he says, the problem isn't really your back. He said, the problem, you ready for this, <laughs> is your posture. He said, it's not really that anything is wrong with your back. He says, it's what you're doing to your back with the way that you stand. And he began to talk to me about posture. And I'm terrible at posture. I'm not, it's, it's still a struggle for me. But he said, the problem isn't your back. It's your posture. And he said, posture is everything. Church, worship is about placing our hearts and minds into the right posture. When you position yourself as a worshiper, when you position yourself as completely dependent upon the giver of all good things, that's worship. Right? It's when you release control like you had it anyway, and you obey what God is saying, and you put yourself in position to receive the blessings of God, that in blessing you will be blessed, that's posture. It's positioning yourself. It's putting yourself in the waiting position. I was talking with my mom this week, and we were talking about last week's message, actually, about talking about, you know, keep pressing on. And she reminded me of, a, of an old song that my that my grandmother used to sing. I didn't know that for years. I just heard my parents sing them only to find out that it had been passed down from generation to generation. And we, it just made me think about this message and, and posture and positioning myself as a lifestyle of worship. And for me, a lot of things does revolve around music. That's just the way God's wired me. But the song spoke so much to my, to my heart when my mom reminded me of it. And some of you old timers uh, probably know this song. It goes like this. It will be worth it all. Anybody know that song? When we see Jesus, life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ. Am I alone? Anybody else know that one? Is that like a West Coast song? One glimpse of his dear face, and all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. And when my mom said that, I remembered hearing my grandmother sing that song. Church, it will be worth it all. The suffering that you're going through now is just positioning yourself for God's glory to be revealed in your life to other people. We got to choose to worship while we're waiting. We can't moan, we can't complain, we can't, I mean, we can doesn't do anything for us, right? But we, we got to just keep our eyes on Jesus. And it sounds like now I'm re-preaching last week's message, but you just got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You got to worship while you're waiting what's going on. And that's through obedience, through your words, through all these things that happen in life. Your entire life was made to worship God. I wore this shirt today. I almost wore a different one. I have a, I have a shirt that says, made to worship. Because I believe that's why we were created. Relationship, worship with Jesus. This one says, just keep praising. Right? Just keep worshiping. No matter what's going on, position yourself to worship God no matter what. Sheldon, you guys, come on. A little more recent song. God speaks to me in lyrics sometimes. There was a, uh, a movie several years ago called Fireproof. Some of you may have seen it. Had a song in there by a guy named John Waller. And the song was literally called, While I'm Waiting. And there's this line toward the end of it. that I, It's always stuck in my head. It says, and I will move ahead bold and confident. 
Now, if you know the story in the movie, he didn't know what was going to happen. He was talking about moving bold and confidently ahead into what God had called him to do. He wasn't promised an outcome. In this situation, it was loving his wife and trying to restore the relationship. But then the next line says, taking every step in obedience. Church worship is obeying and doing what God has called you and is speaking to your heart. Even in the darkest times, even when you're weeping, even when nothing seems to make sense, worship. Job worshiped God in the middle of the mess, right? So did David, so did Joseph, so did everyone that we talked about today. They worshiped God in the middle of what was going on without expectation of anything other than seeing the glory of God revealed in their life. So I want to encourage you today, and we're done. I want to encourage you today to stop focusing on what you need. God already knows that. God already knows what you need. It's not like our prayer time is to remind God. He's like, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I forget. Here, hold on. Maybe get a pen. Right? He already knows. Worship is about turning our focus on Jesus while we're waiting on God to come through and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if he speaks, we obey. Otherwise, we just worship him with our lives because he is worthy of all the praise that we could possibly ever give him. So what do you do when stuff's a mess in your life? You worship. You worship with your life, not just on a Sunday morning. It's a good time to do it. But you worship with your life and the things that you do, the things that you say, the things you choose to be involved in, the things you choose to be silent about, because that is all worship that God is paying attention to. So my challenge to you today is simply this. You guys go ahead and stand with us today. I just want to encourage you, and I know it's so easy to say, forget about your problems. I don't know that that's legitimate. I don't know that you can forget about your problems. I do believe you can put them in their rightful place and turn your focus on Jesus. Yes. Father, as we pray today in this room, and we're going to sing together and cement this word in our hearts. God, life is hard. You said that it was. Stuff happens. And it's so tempting, God, to keep our eyes on the problem and try to solve it ourselves instead of just releasing control to you and worship you while we're waiting on you to come through. God, sometimes that waiting is in tears, but you count every single one of them. God, sometimes that worship is in silence because we know you've spoken and we're holding on to the word. Regardless of what anybody else says around us, we're holding on to it in silence because we know you've been faithful in the past. And we look to the past to remind us of your faithfulness in the future. Sometimes it means looking backward to go forward. So God, I pray right now for everyone in this room. God, we're all going through stuff. We all have circumstances. Family, finances, health. God, it's so many different things. But you know and you see all. And help us to turn our attention to you and to worship you with our entire beings, with our entire life, while we're waiting on you to come through and to reveal the glory of God in us and through us. God, would you do that for us today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.